G'day, it's Shane Dow here from kangarooecourtofaustralia.com. I'm with Russell Stokes, who's the son of a uh, billionaire media owner, Terry Stokes. And we're going to talk about uh, Russell's experience growing up from 16 to roughly 27, where he was uh, growing up in the cross by himself. Russell, are you there? Yep. Yep, can you just start off uh, telling us a story how you uh, ended up at the cross at the age of 16? Okay, um, and again, I, you know, I must clarify the reason I'm telling you the story is to counteract the negative impression that was written in the Andrew Rule book and the Margaret Simmons book by each of my parents. Yep. So that's, that's my motivation. And um, so how I came to be in the cross, um, when I was 16, my mother had kicked me out. And um, in my opinion, she'd had too much to drink, which is was a common thing with her. She was very angry on the night and she took it out on me, so I was told to get out of the house. Yep. Um, um, and despite claims in the book that she said I was uncontrollable, um, that's not the case. I was in fact very quiet. I just used to sit in my room all the time, so that's far from the truth. But, um, but she kicked me out. It was about 10.30 at night. Um, it was a very, um, very angry sort of affair, so I've, I've tried to get out as quick as I can, so I've managed to pack a small bag with a change of clothes, and so I've left, left the house, and um, I wasn't sure where I was going to go, so I was walking down the street. And, and that's over in Perth, isn't it? In Perth, yeah. Yep, um, yep. So I've, I've walked down one of the main streets, Scarborough Beach Road, I think it was, and... Um, I walked past um, the house of a man I'd known that, that used to catch one of the buses that used to go into the city, and um, occasionally we'd well, he'd chat with me, and um, so I saw he, his light on, and not knowing where I was going, I, I just knocked on his door and told him what happened, and you know uh, I told him I was going to hitchhike to to Sydney. I didn't. You know, didn't know where I was going to go if I stayed in Perth, but um, he told me, he, he put me up for the night and said, look, you can't hitchhike to Sydney, that's ridiculous. He said, in the morning, we'll go down and get a bus ticket or a train ticket and um, go to Sydney that way, and which I did. I got the, caught the Greyhound bus to Sydney the next morning. And um, as I was saying, you know, I was, I was a very... I found it very hard to negotiate life when I was 16. I'd been diagnosed with autism and ADD, which explains, you know, where I was at. And um, he, he would have seen that, I imagine. And he knew I didn't have much money. And he told me to um, head to the Wayside Chapel when I got to Sydney. And he said, they'll sort you out. So that's, that's what I did. And Wayside Chapel's right in the middle of it. King's Cross, so that's how I got to be in King's Cross. And you didn't contact Kerry to see if you could stay there when you come to Sydney? I I did. Um, I did meet with him. Um, I didn't ask if he had put me up, but I was just hoping he'd say something, but he must have preempted um, something along those lines, and he just said, you're 16, you're old enough to look out for yourself. And... Um, he wasn't going to do anything. And, he didn't um, even offer money or anything? No. Um, and that was basically it, except he um, he did tell me that if I wanted any contact to do it by letter. Yep. So obviously I didn't make a good impression on him. And um, as I was talking to you earlier, um, I'm not very, I'm still not very good at picking up body language, but... The, the feeling I got was very negative. I, I did notice he, he seemed to cringe when he was talking to me. He, he couldn't wait to get away from me, which he did. He, he left fairly quickly. And um, that was it. Um, but once, once at the Wayside Chapel, um, I mean, the plan was when I was able to get a dole check, I'd get a room. Yep. And, um, but in the interim, 
the Wayside Chapel directed me to go to a, a men's hostel called Matthew Talbot's down at Wormaloo. Yep. So um, the plan was to stay there until I was got on my feet and I was able to get my own place. And um, so I got down there and it was a it was a terrible place. It was full of old men. Um, the sleeping arrangements were that there must have been a hundred pieces of cut out foam in the corner of the dining hall and at a certain time they cleared all the tables out and if you were staying there you just went and grabbed a piece of foam and laid on the floor. Yep. And um, what struck me through the night was um, the smell of alcohol, vomit and urine. It was a disgusting place and um, and of course someone like me that's used to living in their room in solitude it was really confronting to be sleeping you know with up to a hundred people yep. and so that was the last time I went there and um, for most of the time I just slept down at Rush Cutters Bay. What uh, out um, in the open? Pardon? Yeah out in the open. Um, um, I, I found that quite confronting like there's um, without the security of the four walls around you, it's a bit daunting, but it was better than staying at Talbot's. Um, yeah, so that's that's what happened. I um, I just slept down there, and um, a lot of times I just slept in the day. It was easy to sleep in the day. You didn't draw any attention at night. Just walked around and um, walk around the cross. Yeah, yep, yeah, we'll hit the city and um, um How long did you stay stay at the cross doing that for? I think it was about three weeks because I couldn't get a dole payment until they established who I was and it was um as far as I remember it was about three weeks. Yep. So so it was like that for three weeks and um in the cross they had these things called bed sitters. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a small room, but it had its, like a kitchenette. It had a, um, a couple of taps and a sink, yep. a bar fridge, and a little stove that sat on top of the, um, the sink. And so that's what I got when I got my first check, doll check, and um, that's where I stayed, you know. Um, well, how, how long was it? You stayed there for 10 years or something? Um, I was there till I was 27. How did you manage to stay there that long? Um, well, it wasn't. It, there was there was two places I stayed at. So I stayed at the original place for a while, which was in Orwell Street. And um, so between the two places, yeah, that's I spent 11, 11 years. And what were you so, doing in that time? Um, well, I was living like a hermit, like. Um, as I said, I, I felt very, very um, afraid of being out in public. I found it very hard to socialise, so I virtually just stayed in my room. So for that 10, 11 years, was Kerry was aware that you were living there, was he? Or? I've got no idea. Um, he didn't care? I had, yeah, I had no contact. Um, I mean, to me, I was happy in my own way because no one was pestering me. Yep. Like um, when I was living at home, I was terrified of my mother. Yep. I, in fact, you know, used to eat my dinner in the bedroom. Yep. I was just too scared of them picking on me, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so to me, I, I, I had a, a sort of a peace, even though I was on my own. Um, um, you told me about previously about some of the characters you met. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, it was, it was probably a few years before I ventured out of my room, you know, it took me a while to get my confidence. I mean, I did go for, I mean, obviously I had to put my doll form in, but in those days, there were no, there was no hassles, you know what I mean? They yep. you virtually just put your form in each fortnight, they handed over a check and that was it. Yep. And, um, which allowed me to live how I lived. But, yep. um, yeah, there was... Some interesting stories I found, and it was quite interesting in his book, the Andrew Rule book, he really denigrated the Italians 
and he spoke of having lots of fights with Italian youths when he was younger. But, Very. Yeah, and um, I found that when I was in the cross, the Italians were very kind people. Yep. And um, once they got to see me around and sort of I was known to them, they were very friendly. For example, the corner fruit shop, the guy used to give me a lot of his old fruit and vegetables for nothing. Yep. So whether he just saw me as somebody who was a bit down and out, I don't know, but certainly very kind. Yep. And I, I, um, I built up the courage to go to a coffee shop called the Piccolo Bar, which yep. is sort of, sort of um, a bit famous in the inner city. It was a, it was owned by an Italian man, and the guy that worked there was um, very gay, and um, he attracted a lot of weird people. So I'd, I'd go in there for a coffee occasionally, and I didn't feel as out of place because there's just so many strange characters that went in there. Yep. And I found that a very, it's the first time I actually socialised, you know, going to the piccolo bar and um, yep. just some very weird but interesting, fascinating people that weren't like ordinary people I'd, I'd known. And um, so it was a bit of a, you know, for the first time I'd, I'd um, sort of had a place I could go to where I felt a bit comfortable, you know. Yep. And... Um, and um, what happened, uh, I built up the courage to go to this boxing gym. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, I bring this up because in, in Andrew Rule's book, he just, he sort of paints this picture of this guy that's a boxer who's a bit of a handy with his fists and a bit rough and ready, which is completely untrue. Um, the reason I went to the boxing gym was I thought it would give me some confidence, yep. which it didn't. <laughs> Um, I just couldn't do it, and um, um, I just went and punched the bag, and um, and it was my introduction to um, a, a colourful identity, if I can say that. Um, it was an Italian man that used to train there called Phil the Jew, and um, he he used to chat to me quite a bit, you know. Uh, I imagine he, he saw it was a bit down and out, and um, he used to buy me dinner every night down in uh, Little Italy. How long did that last for, him buying you dinner? Um, well, for, for a couple of years. Really? Um, That's long time. Um, I mean, it's a long story, but to cut a long story short, I mean, Andrew Rule's book insinuated that he used me as, like, hired muscle, you know, that I was this boxing guy that... <laughs> he sort of thought was good to have by his side, but the real story was that Phil had a young brother who he didn't tell me, but other people that knew Phil told me that I looked uh, very similar to his brother, who had died. Yep. He, he died of a overdose on the cross, and that's what I believe was directed part of that kindness. And... Um, so that went on, you know, a couple of years. I, I found him to be a very kind person. He never asked anything of me. He was, you know, very generous. And um, but he um, he used to own the penthouse up in the cross, which um, um, you know he, he was a bit of a player. But um, I don't want to incriminate him. But um, one thing I can say, he never touched heroin. Yep. And. Um, he really didn't like people that doubled in heroin. And, um, but, um, I mean, the reason I bring that, I, again, is my association with him wasn't, wasn't the, um, the dark association portrayed in Andrew Rule's book. I wonder how Andrew um, Rule found out about these stories and maybe gave it a bit of a polish. Yeah, well, I, I spoke to him very much the way I'm speaking to you now. Oh, so you spoke to him and then he polished yeah. it up? Yeah, and then <laughs> he's changed the whole context of what I've said. He's, yeah. um, and and he's probably done it on the on the instructions of Kerry, too. Well, he has. You know, that's, that's what hurts me the most is your own father and your own mother, after all these years, you know, you, you always know that these people are your parents. And you always, you always feel that, so it hurts 
when they push you away like that. And um, So they didn't just conspire to desert you, they conspired later, five years ago, in those two books to defame you. Yeah, um... Yeah, is mean, that how you see it? I know that, and they know that, but um, it's impossible to talk to my mother. She won't do anything, but he he has denied anything. He, I did confront him. He um, About the book, yep. About the book, he yeah. blamed Andrew Rule, and I said, well, what motive has he got to do all this to me? Do you, do you want to tell us about how you, how you did confront him and what happened in that? Yeah, well, when the book came out... Um, that was five years ago, roughly. Yeah, I I rang the publisher. Um, I'm just trying to think who the publisher was, but um, it was published by Rupert. Rupert Murdoch owned the um, owned the, the, the publishing business. Harper and, Collins, um, probably it was. That's it, Harper Collins. Yeah, so Rupert Murdoch owned that, and um, I rang up Harper Collins. Well, I actually rang. I uh, wrote them a letter. Yep. And um, they said they were taking my claims very seriously and that the second edition, they would have all those points that I raised taken out. And um, they actually phoned me on another occasion and I, I told them that I didn't feel it was enough. You know, I, think, I said, look, I need a, a forum where I can tell my version of events yep. because the first edition's still out there. And that's why you're getting now an opportunity yeah. to tell your version, yeah. Yeah, so I did that and they said no. Um, um, I've tried to contact the Murdoch presses and they won't refuse to have anything to do with me. I actually made contact with that media complaints organisation, I forget the name of it. And, um, actually, I probably did. Yeah, well, they sent me out these forms to fill out and I did that, but I never heard anything back. And um, I was just too down and demoralised to keep fighting. Yep. I was, no one would touch me. Um, Margaret Simmons' book had a big feature in the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, I contacted the ed editor. Um, he refused to let me print my version of events, point blank. and. Um, I tried the ABC, they wouldn't touch me. And um, I mean, when I say I contacted the ABC, um, I I rang a prominent ABC journalist. Um, oh, I'm just trying to think of his name. I think I've told you, but I've stopped from the top of my head. I can't recollect, but um, I left a message with him, but I had no reply either. So it was like, I just didn't know what to do. It was like um, these people were just too powerful. Yep. And but nonetheless, as I said, you know, the the gist of it is that um, you know the, these two people are your parents. That's how I feel. And you always hope for the best that one day they will change. You know, they'll accept you, but they never did. And in fact, they you know they wrote these two terrible books, and it just. It, it just leaves you with an, an ill feeling, you know, you can't, you don't sleep properly, you don't, you can't settle. And um, so it's, it's a way of me trying to resolve something. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the only comment I got from him was um, that he just complained, why can't you just pick up, pick yourself up by the bootstraps and get on with life? You because know, you did have a meeting with him in his office, didn't you, about the book tour? I, I, I did because I was complaining to Murdoch, so they called me in and I thought there might be some sort of an apology. Oh, Kerry Stokes has called you in, yeah? Yeah, and so all I got was, don't you threaten me, and I'm not going to respond to any threats, and I tried to point out, you know, that what he'd done was wrong, and why should I have to put up with this, but he couldn't accept it, he just said, look, what's wrong with you, why can't you just get on with your life, why do you have to keep living in the past, and... He just said, you know, you're just bitter and twisted. But uh, yeah. how, how, how did he regard you as threatening him? Well, I don't know, but he, he thought that me complaining to the Murdoch media... Was a threat to was him. Threat, <laughs> ...was a threat to him. But, you know, I, I couldn't make him, or he didn't want to understand that he did done something awful to me. 
it was um, all he, all he could offer me was that Andrew Rule wrote the book and he didn't know what was in it, and I thought that's just not good enough. That sounds like a total lie to me. Well, because he he had in, he he. He retained Andrew Rule to write the book to say, sit back and say he doesn't well, know what's in it. I mean, we know that, I know that, he knows that, but I mean, I also brought up, I've gone in there with, you know, at least 10 different articles where he's talked about me in a negative way. I'm showing him the printouts of those articles and he's just handed it back and said, no, it wasn't anything to do with me, I didn't say that. So. You know, it was, it was virtually saying that these 10 different journalists have all told lies, you know. And I thought, well, what would motivate them to do that? You know, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, and the big uh, thing is, he sues anyone and everyone for defamation if he doesn't like what they say, and he hasn't done that with yeah, them, obviously, has he? he doesn't. But, I mean, this is, this is my own father. I know. You know what I mean? Like, um, um, and he, he can't understand why that would bother me. And um, it just doesn't, it just doesn't feel good enough that he would say, I'm just bitter and twisted, why don't you just get along with your life? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah. which is part of my, you know, I used to look up to Phil the Jew because he was yeah. a lot older. Yeah. And I saw him as like a substitute father figure. Yeah. And um, I must say, you know, and I agree, you know, people will say, well, you should have had the the moral grounds not to have anything to do with someone like that, but I, when I arrived in the Trip Cross, I, I, I had um, gone to several church groups, and I found that I just wasn't accepted. I went to the Police Boys Club at Woolloomooloo, I wasn't accepted there, I was ostracised, um, and what, what I noticed at the Police Boys Club, that there were men there that would train and look after young people who went in, but they were only only kids that were able to socialise. Do you know what I mean? So yep. it was a big social event. So someone like me, it was just a big fail. Yep. So I couldn't I couldn't do the church thing, although I tried. Couldn't do the police boys. I couldn't wasn't accepted there. And the, yeah, you know, I think for me there, there's been that longing to have something, some sort of family sort of connection. Um, you, you do. When you live on your own, it is hard to take, and um, I think you need someone to look out, up to, especially at that age. You know what I mean? How did you eventually get out of the cross? Well, what happened? Um, because you were 27 when you left, weren't you? What happened was um, when I was 27, somebody that worked for him made contact. Who worked for Kerry made contact. Yep. So. Um, this guy left, a, there was a message sent to my room and, um, you know, stating, you know, to a place to meet this guy and um, I met him and he, you know, promised the world. He um, he said, oh, he want, your father wants to make amends and wants to make you a big part of the family. We're going to start putting money in your bank account. We're going to get you a nice place to live. Um, said, you're going to start traveling the world, you know, and um, we're going to set you up. You're going to be very comfortable for the rest of your life. And um, and that was true to some extent. Um, um, for, for the next, you know, three or four months, um, um, over the course of that three or four months, they got me a, a flat out at... Um, Brookvale, um, which was a big thing for me, living in that little room, all of a sudden living in a, in a flat was quite um, quite a big move. Yep. Um, they, over the course of that three or four months, I got a few checks for $1,000. They took me out and bought me a new wardrobe of clothes. They bought me a couple of suitcases in preparation for all this travel I was going to be doing. Um, they sent me to a dentist, I had all my teeth fixed. Um, they got me uh, a car. Um, and it just sounded too good to be true. You know, like, for, for, the, for the 11 years I lived there, um, 
not having a sort of any family connection I found very difficult. So when all this started to happen, I was really happy. Yep. And um, then I think it was, you know, four months, five month period. Um, I noticed in the media, I saw he, his divorce had come through. And um, his divorce from who? Denise. So, um, From Denise, was that his second or third wife? Second, second wife. Oh, yeah. So, um, it wasn't long after that, I'm talking maybe a week after that, the electricity was turned off, the phone was cut off. Um, I didn't hear anything for two years or longer. But the next thing I heard of, I think, was when he had met Peter Tucano. But um, the gist of it was, and I, I did confront him when I saw him when he called me in about the my complaints to Ruben Murdoch, I told him, I said, you know, the, the story going around is that your wife was going to use me as, um, as evidence that, you know, you shouldn't have custody of your two boys, which he was fighting her with. Yeah. And so that's how I, what I feel was the gist of him approaching me and all these, all these gifts and all these promises was to get me on side case she called me as a witness. But but within a week of the divorce going through in the media, which you read, they cut off what, the power on the water. Cut, cut my, not the water, they cut the power off. They cut the telephone off. Um, what about the rent? No, they could still kept paying the rent. So you just had no electricity and no phone? <laughs> no electricity, no phones. Um, I did ring the guy at the office and he just didn't say anything. He said it wasn't me. And played dumb and that was it and but the fact that after that point I didn't hear for well over two years um, but, suggests that I was right and the rumours were right that they were worried about me being used as a witness in his custody battle for the, the other two sons. In the divorce battle yeah, yeah but yeah, uh, I was going to say did you they kept on paying the rent for that two years you kept on living yeah. there or? And you had electricity put back on yourself then, did you? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And um, so you know that was it. It was it was gut wrenching for me because one minute you know you you sort of promised the world, but more importantly, I thought I was getting a father, a family figure. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. And when I realised what what had happened, it was very very hard to take. And. Um, so he's kept on paying the rent ever since, has he? Oh, um, no, there's been times where he stops and um, I've had to leave, but that's a much bigger story I can, you know, go into with, with you on another story. Yeah. But, um, no, he, I have been kicked out before and um, sent packing, but um, the thing is you can't live like that, you know what I mean? You can't live under threat. Um, um, he, he basically used it as a power tool paying your rent. That's what I believe because he has threatened me again, you know, if I cause trouble. He, he words the effect, you're out of there. Yep. So, um, so, so, so he pays your rent, I don't know how much, and you don't have to tell me, like three, four hundred bucks a week with him, but his other sons get multi million dollar houses. Yeah. Um, Is it something that plays on your mind at all? Or? Well, you don't worry about it. It hurts. I mean, I'm, I'm happy for him. I'm happy for the other boys. Um, I'm happy he hasn't done the same thing to them. Yep. I, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Um, but it hurts me that he doesn't like me. Yep. And I believe it's the autism and the ADD. Um, a lot of people don't like me, you know what I mean? Um, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt me. And um, and I remember my auntie, uh, I spoke to my auntie before she died a couple of years ago and and she confessed on the phone, you know, among other things, you know, that my mother didn't take to me, but he, she, she told me your father never took you as a child. And she said, it's hard for me to say that, but that's, that's what happened, he never took to you. Mm. And that's that's why what I why I put it down to the autism and the ADD.
Yeah. Well, we'll do. We'll catch up with another another uh, podcast in the near future. But I just wanted to finish off. You had an interesting story that uh, a lot of the listeners will find interesting in relation to Roger Rogerson, and you heard a rumour when you were living at the cross in relation to a journalist who uh, yeah, um, who, who disappeared. Yeah, the gist of it was, you know, um, as I was sitting with Phil, and I, I don't remember the names of the people that, that were discussing it, but it did come up, the story of what happened to that Juanita Nielsen. And, um, and she was a journalist back in, what, the 70s or 80s or something? She, she was a journalist in the 70s, I think, and she owned a local newspaper. Yep. And um, she was opposed to all this multi-million dollar development that was going ahead yep. at uh, Wollamore Potts Point. Yep. And the developer was, that she was causing that much trouble and was holding up his building works and he was afraid that he was going to miss his bank repayments or whatever. Yep. And from what I overheard, what had happened was he, he had hired Roger Rogerson to get rid of her. So the story was that he killed her. And uh, do you know if that's ever been reported anywhere before, or in the media or at all? Or? I haven't read it anywhere, but um, it wasn't the first time I'd heard it in the cross. And, so you'd um, heard it from multiple sources then? Uh, two sources. Because he's in jail now, Roger Rogerson, for killing a young drug dealer. Yeah, I mean, I didn't see anything. Yep. Um, it's just something that I overheard these people talking about, but they said... He was hired to kill Juanita Nielsen to get rid of her. This, this guy didn't want her uh, in the way anymore. Yep, uh, thanks for sharing that with us, uh, Russell. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll do. We'll catch up again in the next week or two and uh, yep. maybe do another podcast. Yep. Uh, thanks for your time and thanks for uh, your story. Okay, well, thanks, thanks for um, putting me on and listening to my story when others wouldn't. No problem. Yes. Talk to you later. Okay, thanks.